The question for tonight for each of us, and it's a question which you will see Yeshua is asking each of us and all who name the name of Messiah, is asking us, are you all in? This picture on the front here is, uh, of course, of somebody playing poker and they have a huge fortune in chips and they're pushing those that fortune of chips into the center of the table they're saying i'm all in in other words this is something i want to bet everything on and they're saying i'm all in the question is are we all in something happened last wednesday in a bible study i was teaching at shuva yisrael in new york uh, we just finished a Bible study I did with Avatzion years ago on the Gospel of Mark, and we were in the last uh, the last study where we look at Yeshua as the Son of God. We look particularly at the events, the events surrounding his uh, his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, his desire for his disciples to watch with him. But they're they're falling asleep. We, uh, his uh, his betrayal, Peter denying him three times before the cock crowed two times, his crucifixion and his resurrection, all of these facts. And we were the Bible study was largely reading the text in this in the in the uh, complete Jewish Bible, with a few comments. As we were reading it. Uh, a holy sobriety settled on all of us. Um, I felt I felt as though uh, I I saw the the tragedy of the events in a way that I have never seen it before. And uh, one of the elders in Shiva Yisrael, Barbara Kupferberg, said, "I felt like I never read that story before." Now all of us had a sense uh, of, of holy awe, and we didn't want to disrupt it. Now, what was happening there? I submit that the God of the universe, the creator of all being, the author of all that is, was visiting with us in, in the Holy Spirit. It was not something contrived. We were simply reading text, and yet, a sense of holy sobriety and awe settled on us. So I want to remind us all, and perhaps the reminder is not necessary, but still we need to be reminded that when we talk about the things of God, we're making claims that are huge. And and uh, uh, I cannot logically attribute what happened the, uh, on Wednesday night. Uh, if, if I say the Holy Spirit was very present, when you say that, what are you saying? You're saying that the very Spirit of God is at work in the midst. The God who created everything, uh, His Spirit is at work in the midst of this small group of people. So I think uh, as a prelude to what we're going to consider tonight, it, we do well to remember who we are dealing with and, and to recognize that we often become facile in talking about these things, but we're making claims before which angels bow. So let's continue here. In uh, uh, the Gospel of Luke, and I've been preaching uh, not by design, but because of the readings of the last three weeks and because of the, the um, somewhat mechanical um, text in Leviticus, uh, I've been preaching the last three weeks in Luke chapter 14. This is the last reading in Luke 14. And um, prior to Luke 14, back in Luke 9, there's a turning point. Um, there's on the left side, you see the picture uh, artist's conception of Yeshua at Caesarea Philippi with his disciples. And you remember that he, and this is in Luke 9, and Yeshua says to his disciples, well, 
who do people say that I am? And uh, they say, well, some say you're John the Baptist, uh, risen from the dead, or, uh, or some say you're Elijah, uh, one of the prophets. He says, yes, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, ask, answering for all of them, says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And in the Matthew's account of this, uh, of this event, Yeshua responds to Peter and says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Shimon Barjona, because flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And after Peter finds that recognition, Yeshua shifts, he turns. He, it's from that point onward that he begins to talk about his, his impending betrayal uh, by the chief priests and rejection by the chief priests and the, and the leaders and his, uh, his betrayal to the Romans and his being crucified and on the third day rising again. It's at this point that he shifts. He also will also see that he shifts from ministry to Galilee. Now there having reached this realization means that Yeshua can and does shift by redirecting them, they're starting to go to Jerusalem. They're going to the, the, the final events. Eight days after Caesarea Philippi, we read that they're at the Mount of Transfiguration. And Yeshua uh, brings three of his disciples there, Peter, James, and John. And uh, while he's there, uh, his clothes are become white, so white that no fuller on earth could make it so, make them such. His visage is transformed, and his, his glory is being somewhat manifest. A voice comes from heaven saying, this is my son, listen to him. And uh, Moses and Elijah are there with him, and they speak to him of the exodus which he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem, uh, meaning his departure. So again, these events are looking towards the culmination of the whole story. And when Yeshua comes down from the mountain, well, actually, before that, he says to Peter, James, and John, he says, don't tell anybody about this until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. So again, he references uh, his passion. That's a fancy word. He references that here at this turning point in Luke's narrative, when he comes down the mountain, as you remember, there's a father and a child. The child has epilepsy, it seems, but really is demonically energized because it happens when he goes past the fire, goes past water. This spirit in him tries to destroy the child. The disciples have not been successful in casting the demon out. Yeshua chagrined does cast the demon out. Then the people are marveling. All the people around are marveling. And Yeshua says to, says to them, he tries to sober them up. And he says, look, this, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the chief priests and Pharisees, and he's going to be killed. And he talks about the same events. So we see this turning in the narrative. We're at a new stage. So Yeshua's turning is... He, he begins to turn his attention toward the cross. He begins to turn himself towards Jerusalem and all the disciples. And he begins to turn toward direct words about the cost of discipleship because he begins using his impending rejection and, and suffering as a, a portrait of what disciples can expect. He begins to use himself as a template. Now let's go on. Now we come to chapter 14, which is where uh, Laurie read to us, uh, not Debbie read to us tonight. And thank you, Debbie. And we read in the complete Jewish Bible, large crowds were traveling along with Yeshua. And then it says, turning, he said to them. And that gripped me. These What's happening is that he's traveling, he's on his way to Jerusalem with all the disciples and with all the, all the, the people that are following them, and, they're all fo and then he turns, turns why? He turns to confront them with something. He turns to confront them because, as happens elsewhere in the Gospels, 
He knows that multitudes of people are following him, but they have their own reasons for doing so. In John chapter 6, he says, uh, 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 or uh, not, not in John 6, but elsewhere, he says, you're following me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the fill of the loaves. You were entertained by being fed out of a few loaves and a couple of fish. And in John, in John chapter 6, uh, when he's also being followed by huge crowds who want to make him king, he turns to them and he says, look, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Again, here's what he says. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Now, there is no statement that, could, that would more gross out a Jewish audience than that. That is off the, off the charts. Why is he doing that? Because he's trying to remind people, look, if you're here for the Jesus show, go home. I'm not here to be the Jesus show. Uh, if you're not here because of who I intrinsically am and what I'm going to do, then you're in the wrong place. So in various places in the gospel, you see, Yeshua, uh, we did it. We did it last week when a man at the at the banquet table says, oh, uh, blessed is he who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. And Yeshua is not satisfied with that. He's not satisfied with a superficial understanding of what he's up to. And uh, elsewhere in the Gospels, uh, he, earlier he's in a house and he's preaching to people and he's told, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. And he says, who are my mother, my mother and my brothers? My mother and my brothers are those who do the word of God, who hear the word of God and do it. He's using that as a teaching moment for people. And he says, look, family is good. Family is important. But what I'm about transcends simple, simple family business. I'm about my father's business, that father up there. So here... He turns and, and he's giving people a reality check. And I want us to recognize that we're in that crowd. We are following Yeshua. And he wants to turn to us and remind us of what true discipleship means. So let's see what he says. In the reading, he talked about three areas where our discipleship will be tested. And I'm going to read this again. Turning, he said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and his sisters, and yes, his own life besides, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own execution stake and come after and not be my disciple. This is very heavy. First, when he's talking about hating his hating your family, your father, your mother, your your wife, your children, your um, brothers and sisters, when he's talking about, it, he's not talking really about hate. He's talking about he who does not withstand their preferences in view of the preferences of God, he who was not prepared to disappoint his family because he is following uh, what God would have him do, you, you can't be my disciple because you don't understand the nature of the proposition. It's like the Shema. The Shema says, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And in a recent uh, one of our Torah readings in Leviticus, there's a place where the commandment uh, says, remember my Shabbats and honor your father and mother. And those two things are back to back in the same verse. The rabbis ponder this. They wonder why are these two things in the same verse? And they said, Shabbat stands really for keeping the commandments, for honoring the commandments of God. It's a test case. It's the canary in the coal mine. So uh, you want to keep Shabbat. And, and if, you, if your parents tell you that you should not keep Shabbat, keep Shabbat anyway. 
If the parents tell you that you should not keep any of the commands of God, you don't listen to them. That's the way the rabbis see it. They see that there's, a, there's going to become a time when those two factors come together. And when they do, obey God instead of your parents, instead of your family. It's the same thing Yeshua is saying here. If you want to be my disciple, then you've got to be prepared to reject the preferences of father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, and even your own preferences. Yeah, even, he says, uh, yes, and his own life besides. If one comes to me and does not hate his father, mother, sister, brothers, etc., etc., and his own life besides, so here's what it is. You've got to stand against the preferences of your family. <clears throat> you even, even need to stand <clears throat> against your own preferences. It's, it's the perfect picture is Yeshua in the Garden of, of Gethsemane. He says, Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. You need to be prepared to stand against your own preferences if you're going to be truly a disciple. And you need to be prepared to look like a fool in society. We're going to see a little more of that. But uh, whoever does not take up his execution stake and come after me cannot be my tummy. The, the person who's, who's carrying a cross through a Roman street is the biggest loser conceivable. First of all, he can't be a citizen because they don't criticize, cru crucify citizens. He must be uh, a foreigner uh, uh, or a thief or something, a low life, a real low life. And this, he's also pathetic. He slept, it's like, it's like plugging in your own electric chair. Uh, he's carrying the instrument of execution, which weighed uh, well over 100 pounds. He's dragging it on the street to his place of execution. He is absolutely pathetic. And Yeshua is saying, you need to be prepared to look pathetic in the eyes of society if you would come and follow me. You need to die to your own preferences, and die to everybody's preferences, and just be ruled by my preferences if you want to be my disciple. If you can't do that, then you can't be my disciple. It doesn't work that way. Well, he then uses two metaphors. He talks about building a tower, and, and these metaphors are somewhat obvious and almost comical. He says, which of you, if you're building a tower, won't decide for uh, ahead of time if you have enough materials to, to finish the task? If you don't, then everybody's going to laugh at you. He says this, suppose you want to, wants to build a tower, you sit down, if, don't, don't you sit down and estimate the cost to see if enough capital is there to complete it. If you don't, then when you've laid the foundation and you can't finish, all the onlookers start making fun of you. And say, this man who began to build uh, can't finish. They'll make fun of you. He's talking about the fact that to, to, to attempt to uh, justify a discipleship, which does not, is not prepared to pay the cost makes you look ridiculous. So he's, um, he's playing hardball here. He says, a discipleship that is not willing to count the cost makes you look ridiculous. It's just, it's, it's of no value. Then he talks about going to war. He says, if you're going to go to war with a thousand, 10,000 men, you ought to, aren't you going to think in advance if you're going to be, be, be succeed against a guy who's got 20,000 men? And if that's not so, then you, then you reconsider and you send uh, emissaries to, uh, to, to arrange conditions of peace. So again, these are, in a sense, ridiculous uh, examples, but it's, it's in order to drive home the point that a discipleship which is superficial or partial is really comical and even worthless because at the end of the passage he says uh, uh, he says uh, so every one of you who doesn't renounce all that he has that is renounce the hold of everything in your life 
everything in life that has a hold on you, if you don't renounce that, that, that control, you cannot be my Tamid. And then he compares us to this kind of discipleship to salt, or perhaps us to salt. He says, salt is excellent, but if the salt becomes tasteless, what can be used to season it? In other words, if salt becomes tasteless, it becomes worthless. He says, you can't even use it in the manure pile. I mean, salt is utterly, completely worthless, and people throw it away. Similarly, any kind of half-hearted discipleship is worthless and is to be discarded. So Yeshua is, uh, he's making a very strong point. He's not trying to frighten people. He's not trying to bum them out. He's trying to tell them uh, what's going on here. He says, you folks don't really understand who I am. You really don't understand what my father is up to in the world. You don't understand that just as what I'm doing requires of me total commitment. So your discipleship requires of you total commitment. Let's continue. Therefore, we need to renounce all else that has a hold on us. Uh, renounce its hold. It's not that we renounce our family. <laughs> you know, it's not that. It's, re it's that we renounce the, the degree to which they can control us uh, in our decisions that involve the will of God. We must uh, make our decisions involving the will of God we're only with his preferences in mind. So, why should we follow a Messiah who journeys to Jerusalem to be crucified? This is a, you know, this is a very, this is a, this is a, not only a sad ending to his story, or at least an apparent ending, although it's not quite the ending as we know, but it's also somewhat poignant and pathetic. Why should we follow such a Messiah. Three reasons. Number one, Yeshua always tells us the truth. This came home to me considering John 14, 2, where Yeshua says there, um, I go and prepare a, prepare a place for you so that where I am you may also you may be with me also. If it were not so, I would have told you. That strikes me. Yeshua is telling the disciples, Fellas, I tell you the truth. You know that I tell you the truth. If it was, if there was something you needed to know, or something that was not true, I would tell you. So the first reason we should follow such a Messiah is that he always, always, always tells us the truth about life, about himself, about discipleship. Secondly, Yeshua challenges us to reject superficiality. In this talk to the people on the road, he outlines the fact that superficiality needs to be off the table. It's worthless. Uh, uh, it's not discipleship at all. Whatever it is, is not discipleship. You can't just take a nosh off the kingdom table. You need to sit down and pay the price of sitting there. Number three, a third reason we should follow a Messiah who journeys to Jerusalem to be crucified is the law of proportional prophets. That's what I call this. It's in the Gospels where we're told, and you're familiar with this, to those, to those who have, more will be given, but those who do not have lose all that they do have. Even, though they, even what they have will be taken from them. The point is this, if you are genuinely investing yourself, if you're all in, in your discipleship journey, then everything will multiply. Your satisfactions, the value of what you're doing, everything multiplies. You, it'll grow and grow and grow. But if you're not all in, even what you have, you're going to lose. So that's the third reason that we should be all in. So, for you and for me, this week, next week, each day, 
here's my suggestion of how to apply uh, what Yeshua has been telling us. First of all, we need to make Yeshua's submission to the Father a template for our own submission to him. Yeshua begins talking that way after the turning point in Luke. He uses, he begins to talk about discipleship using himself as a template. If they rejected me, the, if they rejected me, they'll reject you. You need to take up your cross and follow me. He's, he's making his suffering to be a pattern that is going to be replicated in our lives. So also we need to make his submission to the Father, such as we see in Gethsemane, and we see, of course, in the whole drama of his death. We need to make his submissiveness to the Father and is only doing what the Father is doing to be a template for our own discipleship. And secondly, we need to catch ourselves when we're hedging our bets. During the week, from time to time, there may be a, a, a responsibility, a perspective from God's word, a responsibility, a holy responsibility we have, but we, but we may we may be tempted to say, but I, I don't want to get into that. I don't want to do that. I, I want to compromise. Catch yourself. When we find ourselves uh, playing cards with compromise, we need to catch ourselves because to the degree that we compromise, we lose every, we, we risk losing everything because discipleship cannot be a half-hearted affair it cannot be superficial so the final question for me for you for all of us is this are you all in and it doesn't take a wrenching gut-wrenching situation it means accepting to me it means fully accepting the fact that this is the this is the rules of the game and i want to be in this game but the rules of the game are that you have to be all in and so i need to play by those rules so i guess in the breakout groups we'll be discussing the issue of being all in and uh, of what discipleship really is as far as it involves our resemblance to Yeshua. Those two questions. What kind of discipleship involves our resemblance to Yeshua and also a discussion of being all in. Thank you very much. I pray that this teaching enhances his work in your life.